The breathtaking Machishon Falls provides the perfect view for tourists as the roaring waters of the Nile cascade into a cauldron and majestically escape towards the north. Droves of tourists from near and far come here to catch the breathtaking scenes as rays from the sun setting to poke the Nile. Machishon Falls, also known as Kabalega Falls, is symbolic of Uganda's miracle, the tourism sector that continues to shoulder a wobbly economy. As the highest foreign exchange earner, tourism raked in 1.37 billion US dollars, the equivalent of 5 trillion shillings in 2018. This week, it emerged that the power regulatory body, the Electricity Regulatory Authority, published a notice inviting public views on the planned feasibility study for a 360 megawatts dam at the falls, one of the few remaining jewels in the Nile's crown. Whereas government has already signed a memorandum of understanding with the South African firm to undertake the feasibility study, the Energy Ministry Permanent Secretary Robert Kasande says it's not binding. The law requires that the regulator goes out and seeks public opinion. So this is exactly what they have done. And uh, we expect, in addition to the social media would like the big institutions, Uganda Wildlife Authority, NEMA, to write to us officially and we synthesize their responses and, and, and make a decision. A cost-benefit analysis which shows that the construction of this dam is not desirable. Uganda currently has an installed electricity generation capacity of 1,182 megawatts, largely from hydropower dams. However, despite the large generation capacity, average peak demand for electricity stands at 630 megawatts, leaving about 552 megawatts unconsumed. Electricity is costly for many Ugandans as about 25% of them earn less than 4,500 shillings a day, which is the standard measure of those below the poverty line. Yet even a greater number above the 25% of those trapped below the poverty line can afford to purchase the cheapest units of electricity for domestic consumption at 718.5 shillings. Only 22% households in Uganda have access to power, leaving another 78% in a blackout. The lesser consumption of power is attributed to a derelict distribution infrastructure and a lack of backbone to export the electricity to neighboring countries. The low demand for electricity means that few who consume it have to pay expensively in order to offset investment costs, including high interest rates on loans. By the end of the year, generation capacity will reach 1,782 megawatts after the completion of the 600 megawatt Karuma Dam in Kiriandongo district. Karuma and the Simba Dam, which was commissioned earlier on in March, cost a combined 6.7 trillion shillings, 80% of the money, a loan from China's Exim Bank. In April 2018, cabinet sanctioned a decision to borrow 782 billion shillings from China Exim Bank to build infrastructure. It's not clear yet whether Exim Bank has approved this loan as the Chinese bank has of recent become reluctant to lend to countries with a high debt portfolio. In March 2014, two scholars Atif Ansar and Professor Bent Flyveberg co-authored a paper titled, Should We Build More Large Dams? The evidence, based on the most extensive data set of its kind, is conclusive. Large dams, in a vast majority of cases, are not economically viable. Instead of obtaining hoped-for riches, emerging economies risk drowning their fragile economies in debt owing to ill-advised construction. For Uganda's case with less power from the two dams being consumed, it also means that part of the loan will have to be paid back using taxpayers' money from the consolidated fund. The Auditor General John Mwanga's report released earlier in the year warned that the Uganda Electricity Generation Company Limited, which oversees Karuma and Simba dams, shall not realize sufficient funds from the energy sales to meet the loan repayments, including the costs of operating and maintaining the facilities.
According to the power purchase agreements signed between the Uganda Electricity Generation Company Limited and Uganda Electricity Transmission Company Limited in relation to the two dams, which was approved by Exim Bank, the transmission company pays the generation company only what is consumed. Kasande acknowledges that there is need to fix these flows to be able to increase the number of domestic customers connected to the national power grid. It's not as big as, as we have now. We have some excess power that we are generating. And how are we addressing that is by creating demand. We are working as, as, as a team with other institutions like the Uganda Investment Authority, Ministry of Trade and Industry, to create these industries. Ministry of Finance to give the incentives that are required to bring in as many investors in terms of real industry. To, to, to create production that, that will offtake this power. The Uganda Generations Limited Company boss, George Tusingwire, says the matter of payment is being discussed with the finance ministry officials. Any sale that we make on these power plants contributes to the paying of this loan. However, if there's a shortfall, there are mechanisms that were built into the contracts to see that government uh, tops up and pays for these loans. Now, the question is how do we ensure that taxpayers don't, you know, uh, bear the, the biggest burden of paying this for these power plants and yet they are consuming the power. So that's why we said uh, the, the, the question of energy versus capacity the, all the financing agreements that were signed were signed on capacity because it's the government of Uganda that said we need this money and we know that there's market. So that risk of the market is borne by the government of Uganda. The plan to increase the country's generation capacity is enshrined in the Vision 2040, the policy blueprint that details government's lofty ambitions of changing Uganda from a predominantly low income to a competitive upper middle income country within 30 years. The Vision 2040 document charts a plan to exploit the country's water resources and develop all the hydropower potential, which is estimated at 4,500 megawatts along various rivers. The required electricity capacity will also be generated from other areas such as geothermal, which will take 1,500 megawatts, nuclear 2,400 megawatts, solar 5,000 megawatts, peat 800 megawatts, biomass 1,700 megawatts, and thermal 4,300 megawatts. That's why we're doing feasibility studies. You, are, you, you, look, you do a comparative analysis, and that comparative analysis includes technical aspects, it includes uh, social and environmental aspects, and also it includes the commercial aspects of a power plant, whether it is nuclear, whether it is uh, hydropower. So all that must, needs to be done. In spite of these aspirations of specific concern is that the unit cost of power remains high and is likely to remain so as long as the market for consumption remains small. Tsingwire told NTV that electricity demand is growing steadily at 10% even before the planned industries are in place. This materialize and these industrial parks take off because industries are the biggest consumer of power. When we have many gigawatts of power in, in Japan, in the US, these are industries. They are not necessarily only consumers like we use at our homes. So once all these come on board, soon you find that the Karuma we are talking about is totally is a baby with more surplus that cannot be consumed internally the government plans to sell electricity to neighboring south sudan and the dr congo under the auspices of the east african community power pool agreement which advocates for member states to interconnect electricity to each other depending on proximity as of March 2017, Uganda was exporting 51.1 megawatts to Kenya, 14.94 megawatts to Tanzania, and 0 0.27 megawatts to DRC. The move to sell the surplus electricity is also aimed at getting money to pay back part of the loan to the Chinese government spread over a period of 30 years. Tusingwire says the principle is that when government builds a dam, it expects the market to grow or create it to make the project pay back its loan. The same principle 
even we ha we have in these big spends. And I think it's true for airports, it's true for power plants, it's true for, you let's say, big mineral investments. You always want to be sure that because of this big money you're spending and it's long term, you want to mitigate the risk of not having a market for such an investment. But it doesn't only require markets, but infrastructure to transmit the electricity, which comes at a cost. Part of the solution, Kasande says, is to refurbish the distribution network, which was given to Meme. But also you have to be mindful of how much you inject into the, into the, into the investments, because eventually that money comes into the tariff. So we want also to moderate how much we can invest versus increasing the, the tariff. Yet the government appears unrelenting in its plan of building more dams. Of the 40,800 megawatts targeted in the Vision 2040, officials say hydroelectricity is the cheapest source of power in terms of cost per unit, which means more waterfalls will likely be sacrificed. On its website, the investor South African company Bonang Power and Energy Limited says it was formed in 2014 and is an African independent power producer formed to develop sustainable green energy generating capacity for Africa with clean renewable hydropower. In May 2015, the company's officials met with President Museveni at State House Nakasero about a deal to refurbish and upgrade Uganda's oldest hydropower dam, Nalubale, better known as Owen Falls, and its auxiliary Kira 2 hydropower station in Jinja. Sources familiar with the matter told NTV that the deal was not concluded. Against the stellar performance, the tourism industry was only allocated 193 billion shillings. Yet government continues to borrow heavily to build dams as it glosses over the cost benefits.